Can we put our hands together and welcome God's servant, God's daughter, Minister Linda Sue Parsley. She comes and ministers us what God has given her in the last hour and 45 minutes. Okay. Um, I'm coming from Luke 23rd chapter. Um, my scripture is 34, but I'm going to read two verses ahead of it so we can idea what's going on here. Um, so 23:32 says, And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right and the other on the left. And then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So who do you pray for the most? When things are going well, there's probably a long list. When you are tired or you're busy, you probably have a shorter list of real needs and closer personal concerns. When life is at its hardest, I guess most of your prayers are for yourself. Although you can perhaps throw one in for a real close friend or someone that's really in great need. But when Jesus' life was almost at an end, when the pain was worse, Jesus didn't pray for his mother Mary, which was standing by and watching. He didn't pray for his dear disciples, Peter, James, and John. Jesus didn't pray for the church, which would come into being as a result of his death. At that moment of agony, instead, we find Jesus praying for his enemies. He's not praying in revenge that God's judgment and punishment would fall on those, the ones who were torturing him and executing him, but praying for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yes. Praying for his enemies. Do you pray for your enemies? Do you ever think, Oh, God, I should like that person better. Or I don't mean that they just get on my last nerve. Somebody irritating you, pray for them. Believe me, I pray for my daughter a lot because she can get on my last nerve. And I'm like, wanted to say something, but I'm like, okay, God, you're right. So I'm, you know, I'm in prayer a lot when she's around. But, you know, it works out. Anyway. God was praying for his enemies. We have a lot to learn from Jesus about praying for our enemies. Yes. Man, God changes enemies into friends. Yes, he does. And that's a true statement. There's people just got on my last nerve, and, the, and then they be, end up being one of my best friends. Because you don't take time to find out where they're coming from. Don't take fine, time to find out what they're thinking, or, you know, they probably felt the same way about me. Take some time. Show them some love. Even if it's someone, you, you just get to know them before you judge. Don't judge. You know, God says, forgive people. This is what the cross is all about. One man who was innocent, dying in the place of those who were guilty. Father, forgive them, Jesus prayed. And Jesus forgave them. Amen. Praise God. She said some things, amen. God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And our practical application is that when people come against us, we have to say that as Christians. We got to forgive them. Otherwise, you've been them beat them up and act that crazy just like them. But the Lord wants us to forgive them. And forgiveness, the forgiveness is not for them. It's really for you. When you forgive people, it's not, I'm going to forgive them. No, you need that, to, that release, or otherwise it'll be in replay in your life. Every time you think about them, it'll replay again. But once you release them, you can keep on going forward. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Linda. Did a good three-minute job. I'll watch you. Three minutes. Good. Thank you. Uh, praise God. We're going to have Minister Rebecca Jones come up and tell us uh, uh, what the Lord has given her about today. Uh, shall thou be with me in paradise. Amen. Minister Rebecca Jones. Let's give her a hand as she comes and ministers. 
the word of God, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. She did three minutes because I'm long with it. <laughs> Just give honor to the Lord, to my bishop, uh, Johnny Amos. Thank you, God, for the return of Pastor First Lady LaShawn. My daughter will be glad to know you're back. She was looking for you. Amen. <laughs> Just thanking the Lord. Um, I can't do anything without prayer, so I'm going to say a short prayer of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you. Once again, standing behind this holy desk, the stand to speak to your kings and your priests today, God. Lord, I ask that I decrease, Lord, and you increase. Let me speak with clarity, power, and conviction. Let someone be comforted today, Lord, delivered, enlightened, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my scripture is uh, coming from Luke. The 23rd chapter, beginning at the 39th verse to the 43rd verse, and I'm the King James baby. So Luke, 23rd chapter, 39 through the 43rd verse. And one of the malefactors which were hanged riled on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for received the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto him, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So this, um, I'm going to call them the if there's such a thing, a bad thief or a good thief. So bad thief. He didn't recognize who Jesus was. He was blaspheming him. In other words, he began to speak evil against him, defaming Jesus, speaking against the Holy Spirit. He said, if you are who you say you are, do something. Now, he wasn't asking because he wanted to be forgiven for his sins. He was asking because he wanted to be saved from his punishment. Man, that's like some of us today. Does that sound like some people you know today? Yes. They make mockery of God like some of the worldly singers today. They had the nerve to portray themselves on the cross as if they're Jesus, not knowing that Philippians 2, 10, 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the name of Jesus, not at the name of Buddha, Muhammad, Harry Krishna, Joseph Smith, but at the name of Jesus. Not knowing that Jesus had said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is? If you don't, it doesn't change the fact. The world doesn't believe it, but it doesn't change the fact that Jesus is who he said he is, and he is coming back. Yes. The other thief defended Jesus. He said, but the other rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that we are in the same condemnation? He didn't need defended. Jesus speaks for himself, but he was standing up for him. Will you stand up for Jesus when people talk about your Savior? Are, are you going to stand up for Jesus, or are you just going to not say anything? Mm. That's good. I'll let you think on that right there. The thief said, hey, what in the world is wrong with you? Don't you reverence God? This is the Almighty, the one who holds life and death in his hands. We are receiving punishment as a result of what we did, but Jesus has done no wrong. He was like, listen, man, we're about to go to an eternal hell because we did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. Can't you see the train is coming and we're laying on the track, we're chained to the track. And he is the chain breaker. 
We deserve death, but he deserves reverence because he is the king of kings, the Lord's the Lord, the rose of Sharon, the bright and the morning star, the prince of peace, like my daddy said. One fully God, fully man. Yes. One found worthy lamb, the one who can make us free. And if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed, according to John 8 and 36. So he said, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Do you know that Jesus also wants to be remembered? We need to hide his word in our heart that we might not sin against him. This is why that we, we do the Lord's Supper. He said in 1 Corinthians 11, 11 chapter of Corinthians 24 and 26, it says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do in remembrance of me. After the manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying the cup is in the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do you remember Jesus when you hit the floor in the morning? When you wake up, do you remember him through the day as you're walking and doing what you need to do as you're at work or as, you, as you're speaking to people? Do you remember Jesus? He wants to be remembered. But the Lord told this man, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. This man recognized that Jesus was wrapped in an earth suit, but that he was God. He was the king, even though he never saw him with a crown upon his head. He never saw him in a, a priestly robe or apparel, sitting in a palace. He never saw him with servants around him, but he saw him. He saw that he was king and he saw that death could not hold his body down. He knew that his kingdom was not of this world. This man had great faith. So he said, Jesus, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, not if, he had great faith. He said, when you come into your kingdom, Lord, remember me, forgive me. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, by your grace, just allow me to glean from the what's left in the field, from the fruit of your labor. Lord, cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. Lord, save me. Lord, fill me. Lord, rescue me from myself. Lord, deliver me from the wrath that's coming. Lord, hide me under the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, when I stand before judgment, cover me, Jesus, in your blood. I need you. Justify me, Jesus. I need you. Yes. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says, this is what he did. He asked. He this says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh find it and him that knocketh it shall be open. And Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise paradise this day not someday he didn't say after you get baptized he didn't tell him after he get through a new members class MIT ministry and training DIT deacon and training he didn't say that yes. he said I hear you and I suffer that none be lost but all must come to repentance as 2nd Peter 3 9b says I hear you I see your repenting heart this day you have confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and have believed in your heart that God will raise him from the dead so thou shalt be thou art saved this day for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and the mouth confession is made unto salvation according to Romans 10 9 and 10 this day I hear your confession and see your belief that I am Alpha and Omega and nothing or no one can hold this body down this day I want you all to come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, this world is, this burdens and this yoke in this world is hard, but his yoke 
is easy and his burdens is light according to Matthew 11, 28 and 30. So this day he told that thing, salvation has come unto you this day. This day you have escaped hell and the lake of fire. This day you will be with me in paradise in the moment of a twinkling of an eye because I am an on time God, a right now God. This day you will be with me in paradise, the garden of Eden, a place of no worries. Hallelujah. You'll be my special guest. Hallelujah. Peace, heavenly bliss. This day you can be done with the troubles of this world and have joy forevermore. This day. So I say to you, my listening audience, I say to you, while it is said today, this day, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation according to Hebrews 3 and 15. This day, let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return, hallelujah, to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him and our God, for he will abundantly pardon according to Isaiah 55 and 7, like he did this thief. Mark 8, 34 through 38 says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, deny yourself, deny yourself, deny yourself, and take up his cro your cross and follow him. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. We're trying to save our life. This is a temporal place, yes. and we're here to make a decision on where we're going to live throughout eternity. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if you gain this whole world? It's nothing. Everything rusts. Everything changes. But God does not change. Hallelujah. You're going to gain this whole world and lose your soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul when you on that last hour nobody can help you but Jesus your money ain't gonna help you hallelujah your friends can't help you your wife can't help you only Jesus whatsoever therefore shall be whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous my Lord and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Don't be in that position. Don't be in that position to miss Jesus. So in my conclusion, I want to say recognize who Jesus is. In Mark 9, 23, he said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. So we need to humble ourselves, repent, turn from our wicked ways. Remember him in everything that you do, you say, that you think. Every, every minute you can involve the Lord. I don't care if you're changing your tie, remember him. He wanted to be remembered, that's all he wanted. Just like you feel good when somebody remembers you. You'd be like, oh, they thought about me. They remembered me. God wants you to remember him, remember what he did, and cling to him. Hide his word in your heart that you might not sin against him. And never, 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 never count anybody out. It's for grace that you, by grace you are saved through faith, and not that of yourself, least any man should boast. It's not a works. Not a works least any man should boast. They thought that the thief was down for the count. You know how we are. Oh, man, he, done run, he lived a rough life. He's, whew, I don't think there's no hope for him. But God said, let the wheat grow up with the tears. He's the righteous judge. He'll separate them when he comes according to Matthew 13, 24, and 30. The sheep from the goats, he's going to separate. The righteous from the unrighteous. The unholy from the holy. We don't know the heart of man. All we can see is the earth suit. God is the only one who knows the heart. We cannot judge people according to the way we think. The word judges them, and they judge their own self by the life that they live. Don't count anybody out, but remember, 
What we need to do is believe, humble ourselves, turn to him, hallelujah. He's waiting, standing at the door knocking, hallelujah, he wants to hear from you. Will you open that door today? If you open that door, then you can hear him say, this day, this day, right now, immediately, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. 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 Is that awesome? Yes. Man, that's far as this day, right? So, uh, can we give a minister Rebecca one more hand for that? Amen. That minister to me. Thank you. Thank you, God. All right, we're going to have uh, Deacon Torrance um, uh, Mackins come, and he's going to do woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. And so, um, we're going to have him come up this time. Let's give Brother Torrance, amen, a hand as we go through these seven last words in seven minutes. Our time is seven minutes to so take it, amen. All right, seven last words in seven minutes, all right? Right. I don't think it's fair you put me behind, you know, Pastor Rebecca. I gotta follow that. No. Seven last words in seven minutes. All right, let's see if I can make this seven minutes. All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you humbly, Father God. I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to stand here before your people today, Father God. I ask that you hide me behind the cross, Lord. Yes, sir. Hide me, Father God, let me decrease so you may increase in me. Allow only the words that you want to be spoken to come out of my lips. It's in Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen. All right, giving honor to Bishop and First Lady, Pastor LaShawn, who we miss. We pray for you. We did. We miss him. This is what he said. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> All right, pastor, pastors, and you, my fathers, Children, yes. woman, here is your son. Mm -hmm. Coming from John 19, 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Mm -hmm. Verse 27 says, then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. Yes. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Now, Bishop says seven minutes. I'm gonna try to make this quick. I got three points that I wanna make about this scripture here, and I'm gonna try to make it quick as possible. Seven minutes. But y'all know I can talk about Jesus all day and most of the night, so I'm trying to make this quick, all right? All right, so the point one that I wanna bring up here is Jesus established for us a new family. Jesus established for us a new family. Jesus said, dear woman, here is your son and here is your mother. When he recognized his mother standing near the cross with the apostle John, he entrusted his mother's well-being to John's responsibility. Jesus establishes a new relationship here between his disciple and his mother. But we can take that a little bit further, saying that he established a new relationship one to another. All right? He said, woman, behold your son. That's to say, for whom from now on you must have a motherly affection. Here the word son comes from the Greek word huios, which means son of kinship. So not as to say son as in you know, the slang word, hey, what, what up, son? How you doing, son? It's not that. It's not a friendship here. This is a kinship. This is actual family. Mm -hmm. All right? So not as to say, or to, to say that this means to love him, to honor him, to care for him as a son, as if she birthed him herself. This is a new type of relationship now. This is a much more intimate and loving relationship that comes with much more care and authority. All right. And to John, Jesus says, behold your mother as to instruct John in submitting to a sonly duty. And so from that hour, that hour never to be forgotten. 
that disciple took him, took her, excuse me, into his own home. Here Jesus uses the word mater, which comes from the Greek meaning maternal mother or mother from birth. All right, you see this is a more intimate relationship than someone who's a mother like a close relationship or somebody who you've grown close with throughout life or somebody who's been so close to the family like she's a second mother. No, this comes with, this is establishing a relationship which comes with much more responsibility and honor for the woman. Which is why John then takes Mary into his home as was customary for a son to his mother who doesn't have a, wife, a husband at the time. All right? Mm -hmm. Carolyn Brayfogel, you might not know that name, but we are in Ohio, and Carolyn Brayfogel would have known the proper response if I stood up here and said, O.H. I know. All right, Carolyn Brayfogel was the first dean of women at Ohio State University, all right? She was also a historian, a noted historian, and her writing entitled The Status of, excuse me, The Social Status of Women in the Old Testament, she states, that women in the Old Testament were subject to the Chinese rule of three obediences. When young, she must obey her father. When married, she must obey her husband. And when her husband is dead, if and when her husband is dead, she must obey her son. This is the responsibility now placed on John, being named her son by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this isn't saying that, or this isn't meaning that she is his to be glossed around or disrespected or misused or mistreated. This is saying that she's his to be treated and respected and loved as his own mother. When I say, when I say she must obey her son, I'm saying in a way that a son would direct his mother if something is happening that she may not see coming. I would direct my mother if I see her about to fall in a ditch that she may not see. Now this is not me bossing her around, but this is me keeping her out of harm's way. This is me caring for her or acting in a kindness in the way Jesus instructed us to act. It's good. All right? The word also says from that hour, never to be forgotten. That means this is a standard set by our Lord that has no statute of limitations. None whatsoever, which means that even until this day, this is how we're supposed to treat each other and our mothers in the church. All right, so it's not a, a, a point or it's not a moment where you should see one another or a mother of the church or our, our, our pastor in need of anything or, or needing help or anything like this and you not be willing to jump full force into that thing as if you would for your own mother. Amen. All right. All right, that's a little bit of time here. Point two, Jesus son of God, was also fully man. Jesus, the son of God, was also fully man. Jesus, looking down from the cross, was still filled with the concerns of a son for the earthly needs of his mother. None of his brothers were there to care for her, so he gave this task to the apostle John. Here we clearly see Jesus' humanity. All right, let me rewind a little bit. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh and became the light of the world. He was in the world, but the world knew him not. Mm -hmm. See, being with God, Jesus knew better than anybody else the faithfulness of God. How, when in need, God comes through. But it was his humanity that still caused him to have worry for the well-being of his earthly mother. This is why the Bible mentions kindness over 200 times. We're needed to treat each other as a family. We're needed to be family because that's what we all need. We all have weaknesses from time to time. We all go through things from time to time. We all have faith, you know, God takes us from faith to faith to faith, but things happen in this life. The enemy attacks us in this life. And sometimes my faith can be weakened. Sometimes my brother's faith may be weakened. And that's how iron sharpens iron because there's ways in which I can help my brother 
when he's, he's falling or ways in which my brother can help me when I'm falling. Pastor Steve can attest to this because I call him often when I'm feeling down or feeling like I'm being tempted or I need a way of escape. He's that. And that's what we need. We need family. We need to be able to be accountable one to another because we all need family sometimes. And sometimes the only family we'll have will be our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. All right. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother stand without desire, desiring to speak with thee. But he, Jesus, answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my brother? And who are my brethren? For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. We are all brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers one to another. So in the same way that I would look to my brother, if I was in need, I would look to brother Jason, if I was in need. In the same way that I would hope when Pastor Steve is in need, he would look to me. Mary has seen more than her share of sorrow in her life with Jesus. Now, seeing her son, her grown son, now hated by the very people he was trying to save, and forsaken by the very friends he walked with day in and day out, she stood by the cross of Jesus. No doubt in that time, the words of Simeon found in Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35 to Mary, when Jesus was a baby, returned to her mind. Simeon said to her, he said, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. If you can imagine what Mary was going through at that time, at the cross, then you can fully understand why we need each other. And you can also understand why Jesus called us to be family one to another. Amen. All right? Amen. A couple more minutes. <laughs> I'm trying, I promise I'm trying here. All right. Point three, last point here, and I'm gonna try to make this quick. Love your neighbor. And I put this in all caps. I wish I had my notes on the screen so you could see it. Love your neighbor is so important. And I'm gonna show you why. Here was Jesus intensely suffering through the anguish and the evil creativity of the Romans called the crucifixion. But he's thinking of the needs of his mother who had loved him and making sure she'd be taken care of by his apostle John. While much of his story while much of the story of his last hours, rather, highlight his relationship with our Heavenly Father, this reveals the honor and the love he felt for his human mother. Also, remember a few hours before Jesus' crucifixion here, he was washing the feet of his disciples. Now keep in mind, this is fully God though he was a man. This is fully God, so he knew exactly what was coming. God. Knowing what was coming, he washed the feet of his disciples. Now this not only shows the honor he had for the men, the brothers in Christ, but it also shows an example for us. With the Lord as our example, that shows us that while our spiritual relationship with God is the most important commitment in our life, we must never ignore the responsibilities and the uh, commitment, the accountability that we have and we carry in our physical relationships one to another. This message was so important that he fought through the intense pain and the torture to ensure that while he was yet dying for us, we got this in our hearts. Now, if it was that important for Jesus to make sure he fought through the barely being able to breathe and the broken bones and the stretching of skin and the flesh ripping from bone, that we got this message then it should be just as important for us to ensure that we carry this message within our hearts. Amen. So let us do that. 
Let us carry this message and carry out that second great commandment each and every day, which states, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is not saying that you're supposed to love yourself. That's not what it's saying here. But you're supposed to esteem one another higher than yourself. Yes. Yes. All right? If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Uh -oh. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen every day, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So in my closing, as Pastor Linda said, take some time, show some love. Amen. Amen. I think I did seven minutes. I think it was about seven. 14. You did 14 minutes. That was 14 minutes. Anyway, just Amen. Close to it, probably 18. Anyway, I, I really enjoyed it. How was that? Was that solid? Solid. I mean, I was like eating a piece of steak. Yeah. I really like it, rare, medium well. It was good. Thank you. Uh, that's his first time really speaking to us as a congregation, uh, but he has did men's ministry, and uh, I'm very happy, and I'm gonna say the word proud, in the, in the sense of I'm blessed to have you here in, in, in the house of the Lord, amen? All right, all right. Let's get it cranked up. I got one and only, I got a one and only, amen, Pastor Stephen Worley is coming. My God, me Dios, me Dios. I can't say no, that's my God. <laughs> what? Why has I forsaken me? Let's give another big hand as he comes. In Jesus name. Amen, amen. Can we give God a hand clap praise? Amen, amen. I'm gonna apologize ahead of time because I assure you this is not seven minutes, but I'm gonna try to speed it up. You know what I'm saying? But uh, God bless you, Shiloh family. It's an honor to participate in our Good Friday service today. Uh, as we continue to observe the seven last words of our Lord Jesus Christ together, I've been blessed with the privilege and the responsibility of preaching on the phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So let's pray and without delay, we'll dive right into the word, amen. amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we just wanna thank you. Thank you, thank you for everything you are, everything you do and everything you've done. Thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you that you gave your son to die on the cross for our sins, for my sin, Lord God. I thank you that we get to take this time together to remember the sacrifice that was made for us. Lord, we praise you. I ask that your word would have free course in our hearts. Lord, just open up your scripture to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. So I'm going to be reading out of the book of Mark chapter 15. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app with me, I encourage you to turn there so you could follow with me. Mark chapter 15. All right, so starting in verse 33, it says, And when the sixth hour had come, that's noon, 12 o'clock p.m., there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m. Now that's very peculiar because that is the peak of daytime when the sun is typically highest in the sky between 12 and 3 p.m. But as the sun, S-O-N, was highest in the sky, it was dark, and I don't mean kind of dark, but I mean unusually dark, unnaturally dark, even eerily dark. Something was going on in the heavens and it was perceivable in the natural. Verse 34 continues and says, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, behold, he calls Elijah. 
because he said Eli or Eloi, depending on the, the dialect of how you deliver it. Uh, so they, he said, Eli, Eli. And they said, oh, he's calling for Elijah. And one of them ran and filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let's see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain or torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood opposite him or on the other side of him looking at him, saw that he cried out like this and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, in light of what we just read, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Psalms chapter 22. And let's take a look at the prophetic precursor to this very event. And I will show you how scripture can open up scripture, even in a way that may, may be contrary to what you've been taught or what you may have previously understood about this scripture. Now it's vital that we remain teachable and do not get stuck in our own understanding as I laid aside what I thought I knew and, and, and I allowed the Holy Spirit to teach me. It blessed me and encouraged me on a whole nother level to keep the faith until the end, to walk by faith and not by sight, and to make war against the sin in my life that my Lord Jesus suffered and died to save me from and to, to deliver me from, to set me free from. So Psalm 22, 1 through 26, I'm going to fly through this, but this is what's going on in the heart of Jesus while he's on this cross. You can imagine what he's looking at and what he's feeling upon this cross as this prophetic word from David comes forth. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me in the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am silent. But you are holy, O oh you that inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted you and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted you and were not confounded or ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake their head, saying he trusted the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he that took me out of the womb and made me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from the womb. You have been my God from my mother's belly. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, for there is no one to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round about. They gaped at me with their mouths. As a, raven, as a ravening and roaring lion, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you have brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look at and they stare at me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O oh, oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my, dearling from, my, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for you have heard me from the horns of the unicorn. I will declare your name to the brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All 
the seed of Jacob glorify him and fear him all you the seed of Israel for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted nor has he hid his face from him but when he cried to him he heard I'm gonna say that again because it's the foundation of where I'm going next for he has not despised, God has not despised, nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hid his face from him, but when he cried, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. Your heart shall live forever. Now, how many of you been, have been taught or have come to the understanding in your study that the cry of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, means that the, the father actually forsook him or turned away from him in, in disgust because he became sin? Okay. I know that was my understanding as well, but I propose to you the same thing that was proposed to me that that's not necessarily the case. You know, hear me out, because when I first heard this, I was resistant to it until I humbled myself before the Lord and said, Lord, if I'm wrong or off in any way, direct me in all truth. If there's anything that I can learn from this that glorifies you, teach me by your Holy Spirit. Family, I encourage you to do the exact same thing. Don't take my word for it. Hear me out. Take it before the Lord for yourself. Study to show yourself approved and come to your own conclusion in faith. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, Indeed, he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of God. Second, the two verses before that, in verse 19, it says that God was in Christ, reconciling himself to the world. Now, for us to believe that God the Father turned away from Jesus in disgust is to say that God must have forgot what he was doing. That he forgot what was happening and why it was happening. That God the Father forgot that he was in Christ reconciling the world to himself at this moment. But I ask you this, is God forgetful? Is God without understanding? Did he lose track of the assignment for a second or are we missing something? Often Hab uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 is used to come to the previous conclusion. It says, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity. And they say, see, God can't look upon evil. But if you keep reading, Habakkuk says to God, if that's the case, Wherefore, or for what reason do you look upon those that deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he? Habakkuk is, is, is addressing God in this chapter and saying, look at all the craziness going around. Look at all the craziness in Israel. You see it. I know you see it and you're doing nothing about it. What are you going to do about it? This is before God gives him the full revelation of the judgment to come. So, so he's saying, what are you going to do about it? Even the righteous are suffering and you're doing nothing about it. Why does it seem like evil is winning? Proverbs 15, 3 tells us that the eyes of the Lord are upon every place, beholding the evil and the good. Psalm 34, 15 through 22 says the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against all those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those that are of a broken heart and saves such as a, of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. 
evil shall slay the wicked and those that hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the souls of his servants and none of those who trust him shall be condemned. Hebrew, uh, Hebrews 4.13 says, there is, neither is any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In the ESV it says, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24 says, am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? He's saying, am I only God when I'm here, when I'm near, when I'm close? Or am, am I God when you don't sense me, when you don't feel me, when you can't detect me, when you can't find me, when you're crying out, my God, my God, where are you? When you're crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Am I not there? Am I not near? Am I not close? Can any hide himself in the secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Luke 18, 7 and 8 says, and, God shall, and shall God avenge his own elect which cry day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find such faith on the earth? He was crying out in his darkest hour. With that being said, I no longer believe that the Father forsook Jesus, nor turned away from him in disgust, but rather was with him every step of the way. He was near him, and I tell you this, in your darkest hour, in your time of greatest test and trial, he will be with you. Even when you can't perceive his presence, he is there, I assure you trust him I will say this though as a major warning don't play with sin do not play with sin because sin will numb you to the presence of God it will numb you to the presence of God and I believe that's exactly what happened with Jesus because he became sin and the sin of the world was upon him I do believe that in his humanity, he could no longer perceive or sense or detect the presence of God. God never left. God never changes. But your perception or your sensitivity to his presence can be numbed as you are walking in sin. Jesus was enveloped in the sin of the world. And through the, through the covering of sin, you can't see God. You can't feel God. You can't hear God. You can't detect God. So when he cried out, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? I believe that in his humanity, that's exactly how he felt. He felt alone. He felt lost in this darkness. As everything was surrounding him that was coming against him, he forgot in his humanity that God is for him and God is with him. As he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we may be the righteousness of God. So that covering of sin that we once had was taken off of us and put on Jesus and the righteousness that was upon him was taken off of him and put upon us so that we can see and sense and declare, de de detect and hear God clearly. Walk in that righteousness, walk in that goodness because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. Bless you. Amen. All right, all right, all right. He'll never leave you or forsake you. How many believe that?
Thank you, John. What about when you don't feel him? Is he still there? No, you gotta feel the goosebumps, right? You gotta get the holy jerk. Hey, hey. What if you don't have the holy jerk? Amen. Amen. If you don't have the holy jerk, amen, Pastor Hugh Dale will cook you some jerk chicken. Amen. Hallelujah. How about that? Okay, anyway, he shook her head like no. Speaking of Pastor Hedel, we're going to call her up. Amen. She's going to do I Thirst. Come on, give her a hand as she comes to give us the word of the Lord. I Thirst. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Yes, he is. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we honor you right now. I pray, Lord God, that you will receive justice from the, what you have given me in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you thus far. Bless everyone that's here, God, also. As we lift you up, as we adore you, God, we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, God bless all of you. Yes. Amen. It's wonderful to be the house of the Lord. Yes. Amen. God is so good. My thought tonight is, I thirst, and that's the fifth um, word that the last of the last seven words Jesus has spoken, and it was it is found in um, Saint John 19 and 28. Now I won't be reading very much many scriptures because we are only supposed to have five minutes, and. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. He's worthy of honor and he's worthy of praise. Okay, the 27, uh, the 28th verse of um, St. John 19 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, say, says, I thirst. Yes. Now, when one is thirsty, you really need a really cool, nice drink of cold water. Amen? Right. To quench that thirst, right? Yes. Amen. And, um, when, uh, um, and so Jesus, our, our Lord on the cross, requested a drink of cool water to quench his thirst. As in verse um, 28. Instead, they gave him vinegar to drink. Hmm. How cruel is that? How evil. What can uh, vin bitter, vin bitter vinegar do to your thirst? How can that quench your thirst? Amen? They can't. It just torments you, yes. right? Now, this is he who told the Samaritan woman in John 4, 7, if you only knew who I am, that say to thee, give me to drink. Yeah. And in verse 10, you would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. Yeah. Talking about spiritual water. Amen? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Now I am also talking about this Jesus who is capable of quenching your thirst both body and spirit. Amen? Yes. Praise God. Just because he, he is life, he is breath, he is water of life, and uh, owns every ocean, every river, every stream, and every well in the entire world. Amen? So he didn't need to ask anyone. He was capable of receiving or, or drinking the water of his own. Amen? Yes. Praise God. That's in Philippians 2, 
and ate. He humbled himself even to the death of the cross. Amen. I'm going a little bit ahead of myself here. I want to say, yet he allowed himself to be, even though he was able to, uh, he's a God that can drink, create his own water. He can give the entire world water. He is water. Amen. Yet he allowed himself to become uh, vulnerable unto the will and power of the Roman um, authorities, right? He allowed himself. Because we're talking about God Almighty. Did you know for God the answer they are made at the beginning and the end? That's who we're talking about. Amen? He just allowed himself to be humble just because of you and I. Amen? Amen. And please know that Jesus was fully conscious fully aware that he was our sacrificial lamb. Amen? It's 1 Peter 1 and 19. As of a lamb, as of a lamb without spot or wrinkle. He was that lamb. Amen? Yet he endured the thirst, the agony, the anguish, in body and in spirit, amen? Just for you and for me, praise God. Psalm 69, 19, 21, David said in verse 21 of that uh, 69 chapter song of Psalms, in my thirst they gave me vinegar to, to drink, this statement is pertaining to Jesus. That's who really was taught, David was writing about. Amen? It is about our Lord. That's who David was talking about. What Jesus had gone to, through for us. Yes. And don't be listening to me. I'm going to bishop with my <laughs> Jamaican accent. <laughs> <laughs> I thank God. We love the Lord. We can have a good time in the house of the Lord. Yeah. He's worthy. He's awesome. Yeah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. And Jesus took the bitter gall, that bitter cup. They gave him vinegar because he chose you and I. Amen. They hated him. Amen. They despised him just because he chose us. Yes. Because he, he bore all the pain, the agony to, to save us. Amen. 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 Praise God. He suffered, bled, and died so that you and I can be saved from our transgression and sin. Praise his name. Praise God. He did not call, call 10,000 angels to set himself free. He didn't. He could have. He could have. Amen. Easily done so. As it said, Matthew 26 and 53. Yes. And also in six, Psalms 68 and 17. And so, because he endured the thirst. Love won at Calvary. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And now he is seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven, interceding for you and for me still this day. Amen. Yeah. Praise his holy name. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Thank you God. Amen. Hebrews 7, 25, Romans 8 and 6, also Romans 6 and 34. And I say yes. The truth is, he is my shepherd. And for 
who is forever victorious. Amen? Amen. Is he your shepherd tonight? Yes. Amen. My soul love you, Jesus. Yes. My soul honors God because he is awesome. He's a wonderful God. And it's Jesus, Jesus paid the debt. That's one other thing for me. Jesus paid the debt that he did not owe. No. I owe a debt I could not pay. And I needed someone to wash my sins away. Yes. Glory to God. And I'm grateful for what he's done for me on the cross. He saved me. Jesus. He bore all the agony and all to give me eternal life, to give me hope, to give the world hope. Glory to his name. I am grateful, so grateful for who Jesus is and what he means to me. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Praise his name. I, I, I'm through because of time. But now I, this song has been on my spirit ever since. Um, Pastor Linda gave me this uh, um, thought, but it, um, it's not going to be for long. It's just be three, four minutes, and it's about tell me the story of Jesus. My mama used to sing that those songs to me, the old time song. My mama used to love to sing, and I love to sing. I was a little girl, always following my mommy around. <laughs> so, yes. um, praise His name. I'm gonna, I'm not a soloist, but listen to the words. Praise his name. Bless the Lord. I love the Lord. <laughs> because he first loved me and gave himself for me. Glory to his name. Thank you, help me, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Glory to God. 
Jesus, they want to give him vinegar for us. They want to torture him and make him even thirst more, you know, but wow, the things that he's done for us. All right, we're going to have our beloved uh, minister, uh, Sherman Hamilton, is going to come and he's going to minister to us. It is finished. Amen. Amen. Give a big hand. Minister Sherman Hamilton. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the bishop and first lady to, for tonight. And um, like everybody's always said, it's, it's awesome to have you back. Well, I've missed you. Miss seeing your smiling face. Uh, thank the Lord for everybody that seen fit to come out this way tonight. You know, I've been sitting back there listening to each and every one that spoke, and everything that they've said has been touching me. And Come on now. That, that song, that Sister Liddell, uh, Sister song, it, it was an old song. I remember that song. And Pastor Steve, he uh, blew me out of the water with what he was saying about uh, what we've been taught about. The Lord didn't look, wasn't looking upon him. He turned his back. And it gave me a lot to think about, brother. You know, 2,000 years ago, there was a man that laid his life down for each and every one of us. Gladly laid it down. He knew when he was born, before he was born that, on that day, he was going to hang between the heavens and the earth with his back ripped off of him and the crown of thorns drove into his skull. And he gladly laid down and stretched out his arms and said, go ahead. This is what I came here for. If you have your word, turn to St. John, the 19th chapter. And I'll be speaking on, it is finished. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to stare kind of having followers we come before your throne tonight. Thanking you for what you did 2,000 years ago for each and every one of us. If I was the only one that came to you, Lord, you would have been gladly laid your life down for me. But, Lord, I thank you for doing that. Lord, I, give you, I praise you for doing that, that you look down through time and see each and every one of us and go, I love you enough. I will lay my life down for you. And, Lord, have your way here tonight. Lord, let me decrease and you increase. That, Lord, you will accomplish, Lord, what you have set forth here to do tonight, Lord. We ask all this in thy precious name, Lord. St. John, the 19th chapter. The 30th verse. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. A lot of people say, well... When he said it is finished, he finished his job here on earth. But there was so much more that night, that day when he hung there, he finished. He finished a lot of things. He finished his assignment up to that point. But also, 
He finished all of the scriptures that was through the that have been came down through time about Christ. That's right. We can go right back up to the scripture that was already read, Saint John nineteen and twenty eight. That and at this, after this, Jesus knowing that all things now were accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, say, I thirst. At that point, he knew that every scripture that had been written about him was finished at that point. So it was time for him to move on to the next phase of his life and the next thing that the Lord had to do. Just like with us, the day is maybe our day is about to be finished, and tomorrow we'll move on to the next phase of what the Lord has for us to do. What is that? Only you and the Lord knows. But your job here is not finished yet. You are still alive. You are still to be working for Him. Yeah. It's not time to sit back and say, you know what? I'm 60 some years old. It's finished. I'm done. No, it, your life is still going on, and your job here is not finished. So it's time to get busy about our Father's work. He defeated, he defeated Satan. In Hebrews, the second chapter, verses 14 and 15, for as much as then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. When he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost, he destroyed death right there. And you know, people are saying, I'm afraid to die. That is a spirit that has, the, has people bound every day. It is time that we get set free from that spirit. Uh, because right there in Hebrews, uh, in the second chapter, uh, uh, verses 14 and 15, that said, uh, uh, that spirit is done and over with, uh, but we have to cast it off. But you know what we do? We step back and say, oh, I'm so scared to die. Uh, well, I don't want to die. Uh, but everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Uh, one day, uh, if we do not go uh, by the rapture, uh, we're going to go by the grave. Uh, but I will tell you one thing. Uh, when you cross over Jilly Jordan, the Lord's going to be standing there saying, come on, my child. I've been waiting on you to come home. <laughs> but you better be ready. Because the Bible says, absent from the body is present with the Lord. Uh, and when you uh, uh, close your eyes in death, uh, uh, you're going to be standing there. Uh, and you're going to hear him say, uh, uh, well done, uh, my good and faithful servant. Uh, uh, enter in or, or depart from me, you work of iniquity. I know you're not. So which is it going to be? Are you going to be ready uh, or are you not going to be ready? Another thing. That was finished. The cancellation of sin's power. First Corinthians 15 chapter. <clears throat> we starting at the 54th verse, going down to 58. So when this corrupt shall put on incorruption, this incorruption, and the mortal shall put on immortality. Then all shall be brought to pass to say that it that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks to God, which giveth us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, also unbounded in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that you are laborers, labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everything we do for the Lord, I pass the sea was not in vain. He's looking down and saying, oh, well done, my child. I'm proud of you. The bishop may not be patting you on the back. Somebody else might not be complimenting you, but their praise only goes so far. And if we're out after their 
praise uh, uh, we're in the wrong spirit. Yes. It's time that we say, you know what? Uh, they may not like me. Uh, I may not get patted on the back, uh, but I don't care. Uh, I know I'm walking the way the Lord told me to walk. I'm doing what the Lord told me to do, and I'm happy in it. Yeah. It's time that we get out of the flesh and we get into the spirit. We want to be in the spirit. We want to be in the flesh too much. We love the flesh. Because that makes us feel good. Uh, this ain't a good, uh, uh, feel good situation. Uh, uh, there's a lot of heartaches. Uh, uh, there's a lot of trials. Oh, uh, uh, look what the Lord went through uh, for three and a half years. Uh, uh, they said all oh, manners of things about him. Uh, uh, they called him Beelzebub. Yeah. They said everything. But what did he do? He just kept on walking in and smiling and going, I love you. Oh, I love you. Uh, uh, you can say what you want to, uh, uh, but I love you. But well, somebody says one thing about us, we get all puffed up, we cross our arms and say, I'm not going to do no more. Uh, I don't like them. You know what? Oh, wow. Right here's an altar. Cool. You better get over it. <laughs> because you know what? The church has not seen nothing yet that's getting ready to take place. Come on. Man, the Bible talks about in the last days, do we call on evil good and good evil? Wait a minute. We're in the last days then. <laughs> Everything that is evil, they're calling it good. Everything that's good, they're calling it evil. Yes. If you speak out against sin, uh, you're a hater. Right. And they're trying to pass laws where well, you can't do that. Well, I'll tell you what. Here I am coming to get me. But I am not backing down. <laughs> because when I stand in front of him in judgment, I want him to say, whoa. <laughs> Man, you was on fire. Come on in here. Yeah. You got your reward right here. I, I hear you a crown and robe. I, I come on in. Jeez. You didn't back down. But you know what? We stick to man's tradition too much. We should stick to the tradition of the Lord. And say, Lord, what is your tradition? Or what do you want? Lord, it's not about me. It's about you. But we get it wrong. It's always about us. Salvation from all sin. Matthew, the 26th chapter, and the 28th verse. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is, which is shed for many, for, this, for the remission of sin. His blood, his blood was not this shed for the bishop. It was not only shed for Pastor LeSean. But it was shed for the drug addict right down here on the corner. Come on. It's shed for the prostitute down the street. It's, it was, it's shed for the everybody. He has no respect to person. What do we do? Oh, that's a drug addict. They got themselves into that and they get themselves out of it. But how many times was we in a situation and the Lord sent somebody to us? And just say, you know what? If you ever need me, I'm here. Oh, you know what? Let me go buy. You ain't got no shoes on, man. It's cold out here. Let me go buy you a pair of shoes. Take you down to the thrift store. May not be the best pair of shoes in the world, but hey, at least there's something on your feet. But what do we do? We stub our nose up at them because we think we're better than they are. No, we are not. If we have an attitude like that, they're better than we are. You take somebody that's got nothing, they'll give you everything that they can, do everything they can for you. But you take a lot of people that's got stuff, they hoard it up. The Lord didn't give you your money, your health, your finances, your clothes, your cars to hold it up. He gave it to you to help others. If it's just because you got a car picking somebody up and taking them to the store, that's got no other way. Tell it. Brother's talking about when he told the disciple, told John, this is your mother. How many of us has got neighbors that has no way to the store or no way to the doctor that we know that they don't, but we do not offer them the help that they need? You do not have the love of Christ in you. Because you know what, if you did, you'd be over there saying, you know what? Hey, dude, I'm going to the store, do you need anything? Boy. Hey, uh, 
do you need a ride to the doctor? Anything I can do for you? Or just going over knocking on the door and say, hey, how you doing today? I've been thinking about you. But no, we're too busy for that. But we wonder why people don't come to us when we miss church or, or something because we're not showing the love of Christ that we need to be showing. We need to be giving it out more than we're getting it. But what do we do? We get all bent out of shape because somebody doesn't talk to us and, and tell us that they, they miss us. Well, you know what? Linda didn't talk to me today when I went to church. She must be mad at me. I ain't going to talk to her next time. No, next time you come in, grab your arms around and say, Hey, Linda, I love you. Glad to see you. You don't know what's going on in her life. When you get in your prayer closet, get in prayer about her. But we're too busy about praying about ourselves. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Lord. We should be praying when we're saying, give me, Lord, give me more of you. Lord, give me your heart. Give me your love. Give me your compassion. And you know what? Everything else will be added on top of that. But no, we want everything handed to us by the Lord. We want to go to him with a, with, with a wish list and say, this is what I want. But we should be going here for him for one thing. Saying, Lord, I want more of you. Let me decrease and you increase. Yeah. Tomorrow morning when I get up, let me have the mind of Christ. Let me keep it all day. How do you get that? By being in your word, by being in your prayer closet and turning your dinner plate over uh, and being in his face, uh, uh, talking to him. Yeah. And not giving up. Bodily healing for all. Isaiah 53, starting at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our grief and bore our sorrows, yet we do esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, and him bruised for our iniquities, chastised for our peace uh, was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Wait a minute. Does that mean, uh, let me read that again. With his stripes, we are healed. Does that mean I'm already healed? Yes, sir. Does that mean that I, 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 I have got to suffer all the time? No. That means I'm healed. But we have to find out what's keeping me from being healed. Is it because that there's somebody in the church or somebody at work or in our neighborhood that we don't like? Is it because somebody done something to me when I was five years old, I'm still holding a grudge against them? No, you forgive them. The word says that if we don't forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. And if you ever get into deliverance ministry, one of the things that opens the door for demons, the quickest is unforgiveness. That there, if you do not have forgiveness, that will open the door for so many different spirits to come in and attach themselves to you. It is unbelievable. But you know what we need to do is when somebody says something to us or about us, a father forgive them. I have to, I've had to do that. I have preached in a church and about the whole church come against me. I got in my car but, and I said it from the bottom of my heart said, for father forgive them. Do not hold that against them. I love them. I said, and if anybody has any problems going home, let them call me. I will, I will have one question for them. Where are you at? I will go there. I will help them do anything they need with a smile on my face and love of my heart. Because you know what? I knew it wasn't them. It was a spirit controlling them. But you know what we do? Because somebody uh, doesn't like what we said. Uh, they don't like our post on Facebook. Uh, and they say make, they make a comment about it. And we get all bad out of shape. Uh, we get our knickers in a bunch. Uh, and I'm just so mad. Uh, I'm going to quit church. You better say it. But you know what? You better get saved before you quit church. <laughs> You got the wrong spirit, and the love of God is not in you. I'm sorry. The truth, the truth. <laughs> but when the Lord hung there on that cross between the heavens and the earth, 
And he said, it is finished. His assignment for that three and a half years was up. And he knew what was coming. He knew what he had to do from that point forward. But he was glad for what he had done. He had filled his assignment. But not only did he fulfill his assignment, he filled other things too. When I was looking this up, there was like 16 things with that statement, it is finished, that he accomplished at that moment. That was only about five of them. Church, he did not come here and die on that cross for us to say, oh, how I love Jesus and talk, oh, I'm a Christian. It's time that we quit saying we're a Christian. It's time that we start walking as Christ. Amen. Christian means to be Christ-like. Yes, it's time for us to start to walk like Christ does, talk like Christ did, look like Christ, and be Christ here on earth for the people to see that there's a difference. Yes. I can tell people I'm a Christian all I want to. But until they see a change in me and they see that there is a difference and that there's a better way, they're going to say, you know what? I don't care. There's a lot of people who say, you know what? If he's going to heaven, so am I. Because they're out there drinking, cussing, doing everything else. And they're saying they're a Christian. But they're going to stand in judgment for that. I'm not their judge. But you know what? It's time that we say in our lives, it is finished. The things of this world is finished in my life. And the things of God is in my life now. What he says is finished, is finished. My lusting, my sickness, my attitude, my hatred, my dislike is finished. The, God's love is in me now. So I am going to walk in my anointing. I'm going to walk in my calling. I'm going to walk the way the Lord has called me to walk. <laughs> he came, I mean, he took that ball, he went there, bam! Sherman, thank you. Thank you, you fed my spirit, you tickled my soul. <laughs> Man, because you was hitting the truth. The truth was being revealed, amen? All right, all right, all right, all right. Well, we got one more, amen, one more, and we're going to take a meeting after this, amen. Um, Brother Gamal Brima is going to come and give us, um, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Let's give him a hand as he comes. Amen. I'm excited about this. Come on. We in for a treat. Amen. amen, amen. To God be the glory. Right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we magnify you. Father, you're everything, Lord. Father, I just humble myself, I decrease, Lord God, and I ask you by your spirit, Holy Spirit, that you would minister your word, speak and say and decree what it is that you would have me to say, Lord, and what you would have me not to say, that I would not say it. Uh, I need you, Lord, with all that's in me, with all that I am, Lord, you are everything, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, I won't be before you long. I know people are tired and ready to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. So, uh, man, it's been so good just to listen to everyone. Uh, Minister Linda, Minister Rebecca, uh, Deacon Torrance, uh, 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 obviously Pastor Stephen, um, what is it, uh, Minister Hudell and Minister Sherman. I mean, it was amazing. And, and I'm just, uh, just glad to be a part, part of the team. You know, we're just all together, part of a team, uh, just walking this thing out the best that we can in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So help me, help me, help your brother here today. Amen. So as I was reading this, it's Luke 23, 46, and there's two versions that I was looking at. The King James Version says this, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and having said thus, he gave up the ghost. 
The New King James says, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. As I considered the last words of my Lord on the cross, it was not lost unto me at the entirety of the expression of Jesus. As he spoke and uttered his final words, the last word one speaks before dying. It reflects their last thoughts and the final message that they want to convey and give to us. So it was extremely important for me to listen, not just with my ears, but with my entire senses. I considered not only his words, but how was he feeling? What was he saying? What was his expressions? the tasting, seeing, hearing, smelling, and touching. So like the Spirit of the Lord was saying, go back and just rehearse a little bit of what was going on. So I went back to Jesus eating the Passover meal with his disciples. He ate his last supper with his disciples in the upper room. There's the smell of the aromas of the food. There's the breaking of the bread and the wine. All the disciples were there. But it was interesting that Jesus said that he dipped his hand. And he said, he that dips his hand in the dish with me shall betray me. So I saw the hand of Judas touching the hand of Jesus. And then I looked and I saw Jesus get down and he began to wash the feet. He washed the feet of every disciple, including Judas. I saw Jesus go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray and he asked his disciples to pray with him. But they could not watch him pray as he waited for his hour to come. All the disciples ultimately forsook him. It was here that Jesus, having been betrayed by Judas with the very kiss of a friend, was arrested and taken through several sham trials. He was tried by Caiaphas, the high priest, and then other religious leaders of the Sanhedrin council. He was lied on by false witnesses, humiliated, degraded, and made into a laughingstock by the chief priests, the elders, the council, the men holding Jesus at the high priest's house. They mocked him, they blindfolded him, they insulted him, they beat him, they slapped him, and they said, prophesy who said that, prophesy who did this. Pontius Pilate ordered Jesus to be scourged at the hands of the Roman soldiers with whips that had pieces of metal or bone in the tips that would shred through the flesh and the sinew and the nerve snatching the very flesh off of his back. Then they forced him to carry his own instrument of execution, the cross, through the streets of Jerusalem to be crucified at Golgotha. Jesus was on the cross for about six hours of excruciating crucifixion. You see, you actually suffocate. You can't breathe, which is why they would break the legs so you couldn't push up yeah. because you would try to expand to get another breath. And Jesus finally, after all of these things, these were the words. He said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit and saying that he gave up the ghost. Because in the Father's hands is safety. In the Father's hands is security. Yes. There's rest in the Father's hands. There's protection in the Father's hands. There's mercy in the hands of the Father. What are the things that are in the Father's hands that we need, that we crave, that we long for? Jesus was praying the very word of God. He didn't just say something that was casual. He prayed the very word of God in this particular instance. And it was found in Psalms 31, 4 through 5. And it says, pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me. Oh, Lord God of truth. So one of the first things that I saw was whenever we're going through a trial, a tribulation, a struggle, whatever it is, we need to cry out to the Father for strength. We need to cry to him according to his word. That's what Jesus did. He went to the Psalms. He could have said anything, but he went to the word. What are you walking through? 
What is your cry? What is your struggle? What is it that you need the Father to give you strength for? But what I really saw were the hands of us, of humanity, towards the Lord. Somebody say hands. hands. The hands of Judas that betrayed him in the very bowl that Jesus was eating out of. Somebody say hands. Yes. The hands of the disciples that forsook him, that couldn't put him together to pray. Somebody say hands. Yes. The hands of the Pharisees who slapped him and smote him. Someone say hands. Yes. The hands of Pontius Pilate who washed his hands away. Hands. The soldiers that whipped him to an inch of his life with their hands. Or what about the sword that they jammed up in his side? What about the nails that they pierced him in his hands and in his legs? And lastly, our hands. Every time we do sinful things, wicked things, evil things, we put the nails there. Again and again, we are guilty. It's not just them. So I'm looking at this and I said, Lord, how can we endure this? I'm so sorry, Father. Lord, I'm, I, I, you know, the burden that hits you when you start looking at what Jesus actually went through and when you start really just studying it, it, it puts a burden on your heart to say, God, please forgive me. Please wash me, cleanse me. Help me to continue to walk upright. Help me not to go left or right. Amen, somebody? Amen, amen. Watch this. This is why I looked and I saw when Peter, when Jesus was washing the feet, Peter said, not just my feet, but my hands and my head. Because I know I'm going to do some things and touch some things. I need to see when you're baptized into Christ, when we receive Christ, we're washed. But how many of you know when we walk out in this world and we handle stuff and we do stuff, we start picking up things. And this is why the washing of the hands, the washing of the feet, this is why we need to be cleansed. And then I saw where the Lord said this in Isaiah 41.10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So I said, God, I see how you're upholding the Lord with your righteous right hand. You answered him. And he said, watch this. It's not that I answered him and I did, but it's something that I'm doing with the hands that I need you to watch. The same hands that were used to destroy Jesus. If you look at Jesus, watch what I do with his hands. So I'm looking, I said, okay, God, show me. And he showed me in John 10, 27. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life they shall never perish neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand so I'm sitting here saying well wait a minute Jesus you said they can't come out of your hand and then you're saying they're in the father's hand and immediately following that he says I and my father are one so watch this when Jesus says father into your hand I commit my spirit then the father is saying look Jesus hand is whose spirit I want you to put your trust in how do I know that let's go to Stephen the first martyr when Stephen was being stoned He was being stoned to death and he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father and he said, Father, he prayed and said, God, and he looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, into your hand I commit my spirit. He didn't put it in the Father's hand, he put it in Jesus' hand because let me tell you, you are in good hands with Jesus. It's the hand of the Lord. Jesus showed us a glimpse of the power that the Father has to keep him. He also showed us the power that Jesus has to keep us. In essence, the Lord is saying, as I'm kept 
by the Father's hand. Put your life in my hand and I will keep you. I will protect you. I will cover you because I and my Father are one. The Jews sought to kill him because of the statement. Why? Because they recognize that he is saying, I am God. That's why they tried to stone him. The revelation is this. Jesus is God. That's the revelation. In the Old Testament, because they thought of God, they were thinking a monotheistic God. They missed that the Father had a son. That's one of the big mysteries. They missed that the Father has a son. And so this is what God was showing me. So then I said, wait a minute. First John 2, 22 says this. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. I'll rewind that. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. This is why when we try to say, oh, I love God, I don't fool with Jesus. You're missing it. If you don't fool with Jesus, the Father says, I won't fool with you. Oh. That's true. Right here. Y'all go look at it. 1 John 2, 22, 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I'll show you again, Acts chapter 7, 54 and 59 says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's the scripture for those of you that need to see it. Now, do you realize that God the Father never healed the hands of Jesus? Come on. Watch this. We're all looking for our glorified bodies. I can't wait to get to heaven. I ain't going to have eight. Lord, 
breathed in and he breathed the breath of life spirit into man so when I looked and I see Jesus breathing out and it said he gave up the ghost it made me see an image in my mind so Jesus in John 20 said to them again peace be unto you as the father has sent me I also send you so the Lord was to send us watch this and when he said this to the disciples he breathed on them and said to them receive the Holy Spirit do you see it the Lord is showing us a picture at the last words what's so important what is it that he's trying to convey for every time the Lord breathes out, we breathe in. Because if the God stops breathing, we stop living. So he's giving us his spirit. He breathed out. He breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Watch this. I'm going to say this last scripture and then I'm closing. And it's this. John 16, chapter 5. But now I go away to him who sent me. This is Jesus. And none of you ask me where you're going. But because I've said these things to you, sorrows filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. This is the Holy Ghost. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they don't believe in me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged then he says this I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now however when the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth amen stay tuned more coming he'll guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but he, whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. I'm going to leave you with this and I'm shutting it down. The Lord's spirit comes inside of you so you can be Christ in the earth. The whole reason, that's why it says greater work shall you do none of us greater there's nothing about us that's great zero but what he's trying to do pastor Stephen shot me and I what he's trying to do is he is trying to put his spirit in us so that we can do great exploits y'all we will convict the world of sin why because we live righteous that's why they're convicted they're not convicted seeing him in heaven they're convicted seeing your righteousness right they're convicted uh, of righteousness of judgment how do they get convicted of judgment when they see you living holy it convicts them that's why we get challenged because of how you live based upon the holy spirit not based upon our works we don't have the ability how many of y'all keep slipping falling the slide and that's me me okay i'm with y'all the thing is the lord wants to fill us with his spirit it's one thing to be, have the Spirit of God, the residue of the Spirit. It's another thing to be filled, to be filled. And it has everything to do with obedience, faith, and we'll get into that later. Love y'all. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. Come on, get out a big praise off of a big one. Give a big one. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to take communion uh, at this time. I just, I enjoyed every word. Uh, we got to watch it again, too. They take some notes, some more notes. Amen. But I took some mental notes. Amen. What we're going to do, we're going to have communion. Uh, Jason and uh, Torrance, can you come here? Hey, this is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to ShilohHub.com. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.